Alabama Annie with another episode of Stories and Songs for you. Today you're going to hear a tale. It's a little bit of a heartbreaker and a ghost story too. Set in the hills of Tennessee. And it's called The Sweetwater. My great-grandmother told me stories when I was a girl. And this was one of those that stands out in my mind. She said it took place in Greenwood, Tennessee, back in the 1850s, just before the days of the Civil War. She said there was a beautiful place on the side of a mountain that they called the Sweetwater, where the cold blue water came bubbling up from deep beneath the earth, swirling round and round in a pool, surrounded by lush ferns, tall trees, and a bed of soft green moss. She said people would take their clay jugs and fill them with water by dipping into the pool. She said one would be hard pressed to hold their hand in the water for very long as it was so cold. Now Elgin Thorpe was a confirmed bachelor who lived on a farm down by the creek. He was a good hard working Cherokee man if a little unkempt. He lived alone on his farm raising goats and chickens. Elgin had always had an eye for Miss Mary Hatch, the school teacher at the nearby mission. She lived alone in her one-room cottage beside the church, and Elgin, Elgin had forever watched her from a distance over the years. One day, after much thought about spending the rest of his life alone, as we all do when we get older, he got up the courage and went calling at her doorstep. Right away, they were seen together strolling to church on Sunday mornings and often at the Sweetwater where they would sit for hours with a picnic on the soft moss enjoying one another's company. Everyone noticed that the unkempt Elgin began to dress better in clean overalls and starched shirts and they all noticed the change in Miss Mary once the dour unsmiling school teacher turned giddy schoolgirl. Words spread that Elgin had asked Miss Mary for her hand in marriage and soon they announced a date. All winter long Miss Mary sewed her wedding gown by hand at nights before the fire and when it was done she hung it in her bedroom on the wall and awaited the big day. But in April on the eve of their wedding the church was decorated with magnolia garlands and primroses by the ladies and Miss Mary was very nervous, lying awake all night in her bed, thinking that by tomorrow she would be Elgin's wife. Elgin could not sleep either that night. He began to have second thoughts about taking on a wife, and after all this time alone, he was so set in his ways that on the morning of their wedding, Elgin appeared on Miss Mary's doorstep about daylight, unkempt and distraught as he had been, and declared to her that he could not marry her. Mary stood in her doorway watching him go as tears streamed down her face. She was inconsolable. She shut herself up in her little house and cried for days. Then life went on as usual as it tends to do and Mary returned to teaching at the schoolhouse and became the dour mistress she had always been. And Elgin went back to his solitary existence, avoiding everyone, wearing his dirty clothes with scraggly whiskers. He never spoke another word to Miss Mary, but he could see that she was very sad and unhappy. He wanted many times to go to her door and tell him he'd changed his mind and that he was sorry for breaking her heart, but he could not find the courage or the words. Then came a day when Mary did not show up in her classroom for school. That day would have been the first anniversary of their wedding, and a search began for her. When Elgin heard the news that she was missing, he immediately joined everyone in the search, calling for her along the train tracks and in the hollows below her house, but there was no reply. Then the preacher's wife noticed upon entering Miss Mary's house that her wedding gown was gone. It was not hanging on the wall as it had been since the day that she had finished sewing it and she ran to tell everyone. They searched for Mary all that day into the next and poor Elgin dared not sleep, trudging across the fields at night by lantern along the creek, driven by his grief, calling her name to no avail. 
Just at dawn, he found himself at the foot of the mountain near the sweet water. He struggled up the trail on shaky legs, forlorn and brokenhearted. He made his way with no light from lantern nor moon in that darkness. He could hear the music of that water calling out to him. He cried out, Mary, if you can hear me, I was wrong. I love you with all my heart and I want you to be my wife. But all he heard were the morning birds and the water. As light filled the eastern sky, he walked to the edge of the sweet water and peered down. His eyes filled with tears and he cupped his hands to drink from the pool. He noticed how pure and clean the water tasted, how sweet. Then Elgin opened his eyes and saw her there, a vision in white, swirling just beyond his reach. Elgin plunged into that icy water and reached for her, pulling her to him. But she was cold, so cold, and all of the life had gone from her dear, sweet body. Elgin pulled her close, gazing into her beautiful eyes as he took her hand in his. He did not let go. He let the water take him. They say if you go to the Sweetwater at dawn on the anniversary of their wedding that you can see them there swirling, swirling in that Sweetwater. Now here's a song I wrote several years ago and I may have used it before in my podcast. I'm not sure, but I'm going to do it again just the same. It's called Poplar Tree and it's very befitting of this song. Mm -hmm. 